This is a live presentation. Anything could go wrong. Hopefully, it won't go too wrong. Um, so uh, I'm going to read uh, for the first part of this talk, and um, I hope that isn't too distracting. If you have any questions that come up, um, I think we are asking people to put them in the chat, and then um, we can address them as they come up. Probably for the first part, it's going to be a bit dense, um, but then maybe after about 10, 15 minutes, there'll be more of a, a space to kind of open things up a bit. Okay. Hello, my name is Paul Simon Richards and I'm an artist or a visual artist based in London. I work in film post-production as an FXTD and have taught in, uh, for 15 years in universities in London. Hence, today I will be reverting to a kind of PowerPoint presentation to make sure I don't wander off topic too much. I'll take my headphones off. Today I'm going to talk about two films that I've made, which ask interesting questions about the language of visual effects and the ways that CGI shapes our own imaginations. Before we start, uh, why is that not working out? Before we start, I'd like to take a moment to thank some of the people who've supported my work involved in this presentation, notably Grib Markets Render Farm, who've been providing ongoing support for Quasi Monte Carlo, as well as Film London Artist Moving Image Network, who've been tirelessly supportive of my, of my work since 2017. I also want to thank uh, Tina Gallis, who's here. Uh, watching today and maybe she's got some comments later on. She worked as a director of photography on Quasi Monte Carlo, which I'll talk about later on. Um, okay, so the first film I want to talk about is LAB, uh, which I made in 2016 originally and which uh, for the sake of this presentation, I've started working on a new version of it. Um, and I'll talk about how those two different versions vary. LAB focuses on the topic of imaginary or illegal or out of gamut color and asks the question, what would it be like to see beyond RGB? I originally made LAB in 2016 for a solo exhibition in Arcade Gallery London. Initially, it was shown as a two screen video and subsequently I re-edited it into a single screen version which premiered at the BFI London, BFI London Film Festival and then went on to be screened in film festivals and galleries around Europe, picking up an award from the Focus Film Festival in Denmark. The second film, or perhaps project, as is a better term, is Quasi Monte Carlo, which has taken the form of a series of short films as well as a feature length single screen film. Whichever version you watch, the underlying interests are the same. Quasi Monte Carlo seeks to draw a link between the creation of an image in our minds, which involves the rapid processing of random information and the creation of digital images relating human error to questions of probability and random access. Now, I want to talk about what it means to be uh, an artist in, in this for format, because I know that um, uh, the majority of people watching will um, consider themselves to be artists, but sometimes the term artist is interchangeable with um, visual effects artists and visual artists and those things kind of have crossovers. Uh, and I, in my mind, are by no means uh, mutually exclusive, but I wanna talk about kind of what it means for me to make work um, using Houdini and other visual effects tools. Um, so, uh, 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 uh. so there are some crossovers with the way that many people set up personal projects within the industry, um, which rarely mean, which mainly mean that there's no client which is calling the shots. And that is similar to the way that a visual artist might work um, and set up a project. There's no single method to making an experimental film. Many artists involve other people in the production of their work. I do this for sure, but for reasons that may become apparent through this talk, it's important for me to be hands-on in almost every step of the process. This means writing, developing, producing, fundraising, directing, and coordinating the post-production. For LAB, I had a collaboration with two artists who performed voiceovers and also two amazing musicians who helped to create the soundtrack. For Quasi Monte Carlo, the crew was much larger and there was some funding. Um, I worked with actors, a stylist, musician, directors of photography, produce, uh, and production advisors. With all this said, I want to focus on the why before we get to the how, and I want to talk about the main methodology um, that I go to at the start of a project, which is usually that I work with some kind of narrative in the broadest sense of the term, which I use uh, as a device on which to hang deeper or more complex ideas. Uh, 
This is, of course, a common uh, thing in mainstream film, taking an example of Moana as a narrative device to talk about individualism, community, and the coming of age. Likewise, Finding Dory talks about memory and time in a manner that's reminiscent of new wave cinema in the 1960s. Um, with LAB, I'm not trying to solve a technical problem, but letting a technical paradox create some, te uh, some interesting questions from which to make a film. The key question is, what would it be like to be able to see beyond sRGB color? What might it look like? And more importantly, how could one aim to represent it in film? There's a spoiler alert here, which is it's not possible to represent it currently in film, but it might be in the future. Okay, so the narrative, the narrative um, that I'm sort of structuring LAB on is a comic melodrama, uh, which is, I'm using as a vessel with which to translate the technical issue of how to break out of the prison. This is the prison here on screen of RGB color. The narrative describes a domestic argument between a couple in a small flat. Uh, one person has cooked for the other and made a bit of an effort. The other has stayed out late, got drunk, and is now sinking into the flat, slinking into the flat, trying to get into bed without waking up his lover, who's now asleep, in a bad mood, food gone cold, etc. However, in the moment, the room, which this person knows intimately, in, his, in all of its glory details, is completely pitch black in the middle of the night. And so that person drunkenly starts to hallucinate his way around the space, imagining what is there and seeing things that are not there. The second half of the film is told from the perspective of, of a person, of the person who's asleep, describing their dream as it happens. The dream itself is influenced by the banging and crashing of furniture by the first person who's bashing their way around the room. So there is two different points of view or two camera frustrums looking at the same event. Both characters are unable to see directly what's happening because they're blinded by their own hallucination. Okay, so, and, and that's kind of what it looks like. I should have had that slide on just then. So this is kind of uh, the first half of the film we, we see kind of going into this um, uh, washing machine, as it were. This is, this is sort of a, a trail from one side of a, a, an imaginary room going forwards into this space. Uh, but I want to talk about this from an imaginary, uh, from a technical perspective now. Um, and I'm going to go into my program that's just crashed called Color Think Pro, which is um, an amazing tool for color analysis, um, if anybody's interested. Um, and let me show you how this looks. Come on. Okay, so. I hope, hope you can see that. Um, just checking, yeah, okay. So Color Think Pro allows us to map out different color spaces and I can sort of show you a little bit about what I'm talking about. Um, so first of all, I wanna look at, um, this is our sort of famous sRGB um, color shape. This is um, the, the limits of the sRGB color space. Um, I, I've got some important notes to say about it. Um, uh, uh, um, okay, so when you go to a TV shop, the people in the TV shop will tell you that the new TV that they're trying to sell you has millions, if not billions of colors, or the new retina screen on your phone is so colorful that it will make you vomit. However, no matter what the retailer tells you, by and large, colors are pretty much constrained to live safely and happily within this color model that I'm showing you right now. This is sRGB. And where the millions versus billions of color debate comes in, it often relates to how many degrees between safe, uh, a safe color tone a device is able to represent, not ever going beyond this kind of scale. You may have slightly wider color gamuts on posher screens, certainly cinema projectors do, but I would bet that 99% of the people watching this presentation right now are doing so on a monitor, which is calibrated more or less to the sRGB color space. It might be in rec, it might be in, Apple sRGB or something like that, but each of these are pretty similar. Um, now entering in, um, oh, let's remember of course that sRGB was a standard which was set up in 1996 by Hewlett Packard and uh, Microsoft, um, much like the same way that somebody like Kodak Eastman unified the world of 35 millimeter film previously. Um, it provided a standard for visual, digital digital imaging, which allowed everybody to more or less see roughly the same thing. And as an artist, whenever I hear the word standard, it sort of makes me feel a bit scared and it makes me want to sort of react against that standard. So let's compare 
uh, I'm trying to do two things at the same time. Let's compare uh, that with Aces, which is obviously the kind of the favorite of the CGI world and the sort of video post-production world. So we know that Aces is promised to us as being the new dawn. It's a much wider, much more sort of exciting color gamut that allows us to um, explore all these kind of fantastical greens and the kind of the darker colors, the lighter colors, the more sort of extravagant colors. Um, and this is something that that is our new standard, which was given to us in 2014 by the Film Academy. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not commenting whether this is a good or a bad thing, but yet it's another a standard. Uh, now let's quickly look at the grid, which these two things are being compared in. This is the grid, uh, which is in fact also LAB color, because LAB color has been used for uh, quite a long time, since 1974, when it was first introduced by sorry, 1976, by the International Communication of Illumination in France. LEB was originally used to as a translation space from which print presses were able to convert RGB images to CMYK. LAB incorporates all colors that can be printed, all colors that can appear on a screen, on your sRGB screen, uh, which is less than the colors that our naked eye can perceive. So it also incorporates the colors that you might see in a firework, uh, which are far brighter than this kind of sRGB prism. Um, and then going further than that, it, it goes into the depths of colors that we find difficult to imagine. A brilliant pink, um, which is 10 times more saturated than a neon light, but at the same time, infinitely black. A yellow, which is so bright that it would melt your eyes. Forget the firework display that slightly hurt your eyes. This goes further. Okay. But, uh, 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 um, now, I can show you this graph, um, which is a very pretty visualization of, of how these things work, but I can never actually show you these colors because there are no devices currently that are able to visualize LAB color, particularly not these out of gamma colors. And most technicians here might be kind of laughing their heads off and saying, you know, what an idiot. Of course, they're not. You know, these things are simply there as a sort of numerical piece of information by which we can kind of plot coordinates uh, and reliably map one color space to another. Sure, that's true. But for the sake of this presentation, please sort of hang on to the idea that there is still this grid. There is still this kind of space which um, allows us to kind of think beyond what we might ordinarily think, uh, think into. Uh, uh, uh. So stepping back, stepping back into my PowerPoint thing, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, Monet. I wanted to talk about representation. Uh, when I mentioned the point of view, I earlier talked about a point of view of a character in space hallucinating. I'm talking about the desire to describe an experience rather than making a schematic drawing of a situation. Here is a simple comparison of a botanist's illustration of a water lily as opposed to Monet's painting of a water lily. One is much more about detail and the other one is much more about experience. We can relate to both, but in order to do so requires us to access different parts of our imaginations. I mention this here because I know that within CGI, there's a big push and within a lot of visual imaging, there's a big push to be the best at rendering or simulating a flood or an explosion, which often gets packed in physical terms. Uh, and it's very common to be told that uh, the knowledge of maths is critically important for visual effects artists. However, uh, and not just visual effects artists, but anybody on set, anybody working in production needs to know about maths. However, we rarely hear about the need to study philosophy as a visual effects artist, which I'm going to argue is just as important. Um, and before I jump into Houdini, I wanted to read two important lines from Wittgenstein's remarks on color, um, which I think are, are kind of crucial. Can you can you see that? I don't know if that does that. Yeah, we can see it. Yep. Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Yes, we can see um, it. So, so here I'm going to read to you. Um, if we were to think of a bluish orange, we would have the same feeling as a southwesterly north wind. If we were to think of a bluish orange, we would have the same feeling as a southwesterly north wind. So take a moment to try and imagine a bluish orange, not a gradient. Is it possible? And then if I tell you that it's not possible, does that make you relieved? Or do you get cross with me and disagree? Uh, would you uh, even get cross with me if I told you that it has to be possible? I don't know. Wittgenstein's interesting. Um, 
so then moving on, and, and this is all from this incredible book, um, which is uh, Remarks on Colour. And I, I strongly recommend that you sort of throw away all other, um, you know, there's, there's the standard things that visual effects people have in their studios. Often people have these kinds of books on their, on their desks. But I, I was told um, by Daniel Rubenstein, a friend many years ago, that um, when I was starting to get into color grading, that I should drop all of the manuals and just read Wittgenstein because that would help me understand color grading a lot better. Um, okay, so this line, I think, is one of the most important lines in philosophy in, or in uh, cont continental philosophy, let's say, which is, when dealing with logic, one cannot imagine that, or saying one cannot imagine that, means one doesn't know what one should imagine here. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that when, when we think about our grid of impossible imaginary colors, that, um, I, that of course the computers tell us that we, we don't know what to see there, uh, the levels of representation um, don't go anywhere near there, but there is this whole zone like the bottom of the ocean that we don't really know what it looks like, what it feels like to be in the same room as a, a brilliant blue that's so in, impossibly saturated, but at the same time so impossibly dark or something like that. Um, now, even though the history of visual effects is premised on using methods to describe impossible events, intergalactic space battles and magic, etc., we have Houdini, which tells us that we can do anything, and which is possibly true. But I think it's very difficult to make work, to make um, an image. There we go. Um, to, make an, to make an image, um, whether it be films or music or literature, which describes something that we're told is not actually there or is actually invisible. So even though we can just, you know, I was watching the end sequence sequence in preparation for this talk, I was told that Guardians of the Galaxy 2 was a good example of, of using color. I haven't seen those films, but I watched the end sequence, which was I was told was a kind of a good example, where there's a fireworks display, an intergalactic fireworks display. And I, I felt when I watched the sequence, I won't do any spoiler alerts, that um, the idea of being on a spaceship and looking out and watching a fleet of imaginary monsters from another dimension doing a kind of fireworks display, I, I felt slightly disappointed that it kind of looked like the exact same particle effect display that we see in almost every other film. I think that an awful lot in that film is probably from the clips that I've seen is breathtaking and amazing. But in that particular moment, I feel like I just wish that uh, we could sort of shake it about a little bit and do something different. Um, okay. So the other thing I wanted to say is that, that the reason why it wasn't done differently is because it is very it is very difficult to describe the impossible or the imaginary. Um, likewise, if there are lots of artists and writers and filmmakers and, and whatnot that try and talk about being intoxicated or drunk, and that in itself is a slightly difficult thing to do because um, the experience of being intoxicated is um, is one thing, but being having a sort of detailed memory of that when one is sober enough to kind of write it down. Is, is, um, is complicated to say the least. And then to then try and make an audience themselves intoxicated is, is a next level of, uh, level of complexity. Uh, and I, I guess that I'm quite freely here relating impossible colors with intoxication or hallucination, um, but largely because I'm thinking about um, experience in general, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry. I'm looking at my notes. Okay, but but the one thing that um, that stands out here when it comes to visual effects, unfortunately, despite the amazing tools that we have, it's not often that we see visual effects that are used in a way that really truly move us to be into unknown territory. Um, that hasn't always been the case. Uh, what about Kubrick in 2001 Space Odyssey? Every time I watch it, I come out with a whole range of responses, which is sometimes uncomfortable. Uh, sometimes euphoric. It sort of uh, it does a thing physically to you, which is kind of difficult to talk about. And I will later on talk about a few artists that are, have been historically linked to that kind of work. Um, but specifically, right now, I just wanted to mention Michael Snow. For anybody who's has any interest in sort of psychedelic film or um, structuralist film or structural film, um, I, sort of a very easy or useful way to get into this is to watch Michael Snow's wave, wavelength. 
And I particularly wanted to point him out for the um, side effects crew because he is a, a sort of a darling of Toronto. And um, he made, whilst he is a fantastic artist, he made that god awful sculpture which is on the side of the um, uh, the baseball stadium, the um, the Blue Jay Stadium, which I think is a sort of reprehensible. <laughs> I won't go any further, but um, it's not the same as this, this film. This film um, uh, consists of a, a camera moving over 45 minutes consistently towards a wall. Um, and it does so very, very slowly and it incorporates a whole range of events which happen in color and in sound. It's expi explicitly based on Michael Snow's experience of LSD um, and also his experience of thinking about perception and time. Uh, which is frankly neither, it doesn't matter whether it's about um, drugs as such, but it, it does matter that it's about uh, kind of enduring a moment. It could very much be about having a panic attack or having a euphoric moment. Um, it also could be about having a migraine. It's sort of the use of film as an object to kind of take an audience to somewhere that doesn't fit into the sort of standard um, approaches of, of, of film. So my thing says that we should watch a little bit of LAB of my film, <laughs> since I've been slagging everybody else off. Um, so hopefully you can hear this. In fact, I'm, I'm going to just play a tiny bit. Can you, can you hear that? Yeah, we I can can't hear. believe you're... Sorry. Yes? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Let me put this in. I can't believe you were able to sleep so peacefully between all of these pointed tables and jagged surfaces. The laptop half rested on a pile of books, ready to slide off the table at any time. The spindle of CD-ROMs so close to the edge. The plates in the sink, the coat on the hook, which would fall with the lightest touch. The pile of ties in the middle of the floor. Your little still lifes that you make so delicately. A receipt, a half full glass of water, pocket fluff and a few coins. I sort of threw myself into the darkness. I took big steps at first and then smaller and smaller until I started to shuffle. My hands were out in front of me, my legs really rigid. I had falls or drafts of falls in my mind when my shins were taken out by obstacles that I hadn't previously spotted. The obstacles became increasingly abstract as I moved away from the safety of the doorway. A rogue shoebox, a jungle vine, a sine wave. Each time I enacted the fall in my head, my whole body wobbled. Okay, so that, well, that is a kind of hybrid of <laughs> the original LAB and, and the newer version. Um, and I, I will talk, I'm going to jump into Houdini now to just talk about that. But before I do, let's do a detour via Photoshop, because I have a feeling that um, some people here may not understand what LAB is, because it's sort of one of those rarely spoken about things. Um, but very, very quickly, we will recognize that um, standard um, images in various different formats tend to kind of come packaged to us in different color channels. We have a red, a green, and a blue color channel. And within traditional um, image making, um, each of these channels contain uh, both color and tonal information. Um, but most of our imaging packages allow us to, and I'm just using Photoshop here because it is sort of a, a, a useful demonstration tool. Um, if I move it into LAB color mode, we have the opportunity to look at um, these different color channels, which are kind of a bit more alien, a bit stranger. Um, first of all, we have a sort of photographic looking, quite familiar sounding um, image. And this is the lightness channel, the L channel. And then we have these two other very strange channels, which are called the A and the B channel, which kind of look automatically a little bit psychedelic. Uh, what you might notice straight away is that neither of these two channels uh, veer very far away from 50% gray, which is the ultimate kind of core middle. And everything is a sort of relational distance from those things because they're, they're sticking uh, very safely to the rules. So this is an image that originated in RGB. But if I was to simply um, increase the contrast in these two channels to kind of give them a little bit more kind of kick to, to make them look more, um, I don't know, a bit more exciting, a bit to make the channels themselves have a bit more kind of um, tone to them, then 
uh, there's kind of an extreme lightness there. Then suddenly we get this image, which is sort of pretty blown out and pretty kind of um, uh, a bit galling to look at. Yet the color information is there. And just a, a quick description here where Photoshop and or pretty much all of our um, the way in which our devices are, are set up is to say that every time a, a color hits that kind of clamped threshold of the 255 maximum or zero maximum um, of RGB, um, these the colors that we're looking at on screen at the moment are way outside of that. And um, the computer panics and it puts in a proxy version of what it thinks should be there. So if I put these back into ColorThink Pro, where we talked about before, this is the sRGB shape that we looked at before. And I'm just gonna quickly have to do this again because the computer crashed. Uh, sorry, this is, this looks, where is it? Desktop, so lab example, here we go, lab example. Open. Okay, so here is the image and I'm able to extract a unique color value list, which is gonna take a second. Um, if there's any questions about it, maybe this is a good moment because I'm kind of gone into sort of um, presentation mode. Uh, 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 um. So this is the image that we started with. Um, this is a kind of visual representation of that first image. And let me show you what's happened when we've increased the contrast in the, uh, 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 we've increased the color contrast that uh, we have this other image and we're gonna extract the colors. Come on. Just thinking, <laughs> this is the problem of doing live presentations. Uh, I had a question while we're waiting for this. Please, yeah. um, you know, one thing that's got me thinking about was other animals, other creatures who have um, a wider ability to view colors than humans. And I'm wondering if yeah. that work. You know, I think of the mantis shrimp as probably a really famous example that most people know about that has this like incredible range of colors that it can see. And I was just wondering if that sort of the experience of any of those animals and, and the idea of experiencing the world from the point of view of any of those animals has kind of worked its way into your artwork. Well, I mean, it, it does in the sense that, oh, hang on, we've got this. Uh, it does in the sense, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and I'd love to know what it looks like uh, in that way. Um, um, the, those things are kind of built into the, the optics of we can map those things. I could get the color profiles of, of uh, an equivalent color profile to show you and put it on here. And, and I'm sure it would be exaggerated in certain ways. We'd be able to draw a, a sort of a graph of it. Um, I haven't specifically kind of um, worked with that myself, um, but I should do. <laughs> um, this is just going to take a second because it's blowing up a computer. Right. Okay. Is that can you even see that? Yeah, we can see. Okay, so I, mean, I was, it was sort of supposed to be a kind of qu quasi impressive kind of comparison to show that the moment we start tweaking with the colors in, um, in, in from a sort of basic sRGB image, um, there is color information there. It looks crap on screen. It really looks crap because the, the kind of devices that we have keep pushing in these kind of proxy images, but it's there. And, and you know, to, to the fact that we were kind of skewing the color, we're at the moment within the kind of the proximity of, of what the shrimp is able to see closer to that, that kind of thing. Um, and I guess that this, this is teasingly um, interesting to know that it's there, but it's sort of somehow unreachable, much like a sort of an idea of stepping out of language in, in metaphysics. It's kind of there and not there at the same time. Um, for the sort of Houdini people who are here, I just wanted to kind of just talk through a little bit about what I've been doing to kind of to use that as a um, a, of a way of thinking through the newer sort of versions of this thing. And, and I've set up the, the same objects here, which in their sort of current iteration look a bit like, I don't know, condoms or something. Um, but I've kind of set out a, um, 
a grid and a, a bedroom space which is 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 plotted to the same um, kind of it's it's at the one hand uh, a bedroom which is a a, um, a a dining room a, a living room a bathroom and so on it's a sort of a bed sit flat which has the right proportions but it's also a container for all imaginary color as it were um, and that, that that is the kind of the space within which this film operates and um, beyond that let's remove this grid for the moment it kind of exists as as uh, perhaps the character that I talked about exists in in kind of total blackness it's it's up to us to retrace into the space in order to um, to kind of imagine what what might be there and as a really sort of quick uh, description of what I've been working with is um, I've been kind of looking at castro uh, of camera frustrums frust frustrums um, and in fact for anybody who's who doesn't know what I'm talking about I'm talking about um, this let me light this better so you can see it or not better okay so here is a camera frustrum which is attached to a camera um, and it just simply describes the um, it describes the field of view of the camera it acts as an object and um, so I guess that my most recent iteration of LAB was to, to think what happens if that we take uh, if we sort of remove ourselves from the standard idea of a, a sort of flat image plane um, and this kind of idea of a, of a, a field of view but instead use a, a color uh, to, to kind of, or a color space to map this frustrum. So um, let's turn this one off and turn this one back on and it's opacity up and hopefully it should work. So I was looking at the sRGB model that I made. Here we go, there we go. So I set up a, uh, the sRGB space as this kind of frustrum as a kind of point of view where we have one character moving into the room um, and is kind of seeing things through a certain optic, as it were. Um, and I have been working with Redshift at the moment to um, to set up uh, a depth of field that is uh, based on the shape of this, as well as um, using the colors to kind of um, make interesting alterations to the image. Um, so that's one thing. And then there's a second frustrum uh, from the person who's in the bed kind of looking around and thinking about what's going on in the room at the same time. Um, and then what else is there? There is, I guess, there's the result of this, which is to kind of map, let me do some quick changes to map here, I think, um, to map this in sort of an interesting way um, as a projection of color or absence of color. Uh, into the space. So what I've done is I've taken the the, the frustrum and um, used it as a uh, as a kind of a negative space uh, from which I color the geometry. I don't know if that's totally clear to you um, to see what's going on here, but I'm, I'll put myself in the position of the camera. So hopefully that will be clearer. So basically wherever we're moving we're kind of um we're able to see things from a distance but as we get closer to them the possibility of seeing that um exact set of color information becomes less and less so the we see less and less of the um, washing machine as we get closer and closer to it um okay and, and part of the reason why i say all of this is because in a in a the, the project as a whole that i've been working on the, the original version of lab um existed very much in a vast um, color space, but there wasn't a huge amount of information other than what you could see in the image. Um, whereas now I've kind of worked back into it to add a, a whole group of visual effects, which exist on the periphery, on this peripheral scale, um, which will only ever exist in, um, I don't know, these invisible spaces as it were. And um, my, the problems that I've been having in order to kind of um, actually ground those back into Houdini language have been immense because while Houdini does support LAB color and while Nuke does support LAB color and while Resolve does support LAB color, they, they do so in such strange ways. And, and um, I haven't been able to yet kind of um, 
work with it in a sort of useful way. So I, I find myself often uh, moving back to, um, believe it or not, Photoshop to write script, Python scripts for Photoshop to kind of um, uh, to iterate over a series of frames that were born into RGB that then kind of get expanded in different ways in LAB. Um, and then are written out as a series of, uh, as a sequence of TIFF files so that um, they exist in LAB uh, if there were ever to be a monitor or a projector that could show them in LAB, which might be able to reveal some of these uh, interesting uh, fireworks or, or um, ribbons or whatever. Um, but until there is that thing, um, then at the moment you just get to see a sort of slightly saturated image, let's say. Um, so the, I guess the final thing that I wanted to say about this is that it's uh, this way of working is very familiar to me, this kind of thing where I set up a, work with a paradox, and the paradox here is very much the one of um, thinking through an image that, I'll go away, uh, thinking through an image that we're looking at, but we can't see it, as it were. Um, and um, yeah, I just wanted to say that it's almost like a sort of lump of coal that contains a, a diamond inside it that you kind of can't see it, but you know it's there. So there's this kind of, um, that I guess that's what makes it a piece of art rather than um, in the sense that it, not not trying to raise it into a higher ground, but just, just simply to say that it works conceptually and it requires you to, to kind of watch it, engage with it, but then also to maybe walk away and think about what you didn't see or what you, you know, imagined that you didn't see. Some of those um, Wittgensteinian style questions. Um, yeah, and so I, I very quickly wanted to, to rush through um, a couple of things here. Um, the, the ways that I'm working, the ways that I'm talking about working, unfortunately, uh, fortunately, I'm not the only person that works in this way and that there's been a history of um, artists, uh, visual artists like myself that work between industry and um, uh, sort of making work for whatever that other thing is, the art world, whatever that means. And Oscar Fischinger is a, is a really great example, uh, a, a beautiful filmmaker and a beautiful animator, beautiful uh, draftsman who uh, also, I don't know, worked a lot in industry worked, had an untimely um, ending to working with uh, Disney on uh, the, the the planning for Fantasia, but massively influenced the way that that looked. And I do strongly recommend uh, anybody here who doesn't know Fishinger's work to kind of look at look at it. Um, many people call him the, you know, the godfather of visual effects, or of, um, not visual effects, of, of motion graphics, let's say. Um, uh, and just, I, I also just wanted to blast through this kind of whole group of men. There were always men uh, from the West Coast of America that were sort of working in the 50s, 60s, and 70s who were highly influential on that moment in um, cinema, mainstream cinema, which was kind of Kubrick, um, Spielberg, that kind of stuff where um, Lucas, when, um, when people were making 2001 Space Odyssey, Star Wars, when these kind of, um, when, when effects were kind of, coming in there, it was at that time quite fashionable to have these artists involved with the work, particularly because a number of them, like Norman McLaren and Pat O'Neill, were working in the um, the art schools in Los Angeles, uh, and not just the art schools, but in the film schools, kind of teaching experimental film courses. So Norman McLaren, hopefully some of you know his work, um, won a handful of Oscars for his short films, uh, which kind of look, which take many different forms and are very interesting to look at. Um, Jordan Belson, uh, who was very much into Zen Buddhism uh, and sort of taking um, people into a space of breathing and, and thinking about kind of meditation practices um, and using film as a way to expand the mind to do that. Um, again, Jordan Belson was part of this teaching kind of group uh, that were involved in teaching the young Steven Spielberg and so on. Um, I've talked about Pat O'Neill, I think, who was, I believe, involved in um, Blade Runner and working on the, the team for the for the visual effects for that. James and John Whitney, hopefully you will know these people, um, who uh, have produced some extraordinary work. And, and while all of the work that we see in, in sort of Houdini motion graphics today is super interesting, there's very little that people are doing now that didn't happen with these guys pro programming it on ginormous room sized computers. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I think that 
I, I strongly recommend that you, if you don't know their work, go to the Center for Visual Music as a sort of starting point, because that's uh, the archive, let's say, of, of this kind of work that will provide you with resources and links and so on to go for it. Uh, one other person that I, is a personal favorite is Zbigniew Rubinsky. Uh, sorry, in fact, maybe Tina can tell me how to say it properly. Um, but um, uh, his, his work is extraordinary. Um, this particular film, The Fourth Dimension, is absolutely out of this world. Um, the film is about 50 minutes long. It's, it's almost unwatchable. Um, and within it, um, the camera spins in this kind of amazing way. It's, he made a sort of photo scanner which scans around objects and spins around um, repeatedly um, around objects and people in this kind of like really saccharine love story between these two bodies. Um, but it's, it's extraordinary to watch. Um, and he allegedly was involved in the, the forming of um, the building of HDV as a video format. Um, and he also won an Oscar for um, his short film Tango. Um, Taina, how do I say his surname? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Somebody here must be able to say it. No, okay, fine. Okay, I'm going to carry on. Um, I have, yeah, I, I have lots more to, to, I mean, there's a whole sort of other batch of things I want to say, which isn't so dense. It's a bit more lighthearted, let's say. Um, but I, I guess I wondered, is there any questions at this point? Uh, there is one speak. question in the chat right now yeah. from Malcolm, which is, how does color think fit into your general workflow? Is it more the grading part? Uh, no, all the way through. Color, color think Pro is extraordinary. Um, it's sort of, I use it as an analytical tool um, more than anything. And let me just go back to it. Um, it's, it's sort of a bit clunky <laughs> in the sense that I'm trying to make it do work, which uh, it, it, it doesn't, is sometimes crashes, but basically it allows me to analyze images and to work with them in, in Nuke or work with them in Photoshop or sometimes in Houdini, but it allows me to see and map out things uh, that are in an image and, and certainly is an analytic tool. Um, I actually don't use it in grading at all. It's, it's more for when I'm kind of thinking through um, the sort of the practicalities of what does an image actually look like and, and how might it sort of be used as it were. Um, I, I, I've mainly used it in relation to the project relating to LAB, but the, I haven't shown you half of what it can do, and um, I haven't. I don't really. I don't really know how much it can do. It it it, it does this really fancy thing where you shift a um, one color, one image to it. In, if you conform it to another color space, it, it um, draws that out in vectors, and it looks extremely pretty. <laughs> yeah, um, but I just. Uh, what, oh. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I just want to encourage um, everybody to ask questions. You can either put them in the chat, or if you're brave, you can, you know, just turn on your mic and go for it. Just jump yeah. in there. Um, and while we're waiting for other questions, uh, I was really, I'll, I'll keep asking questions <laughs> until other people Please jump do, in. Yeah. Um, there was the, uh, you said at the beginning that you thought it was as important for someone to learn philosophy as it was to learn math. Um, Absolutely. I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit, maybe give like what a practical example of that might be. Um, well, there, there you go, Andrew, you've asked for a practical example, and that, that's, that's where, <laughs> unfortunately, the, the, the kind of the whole thing collapses, because we end up being in a situation where, um, where I don't know, the, the problem with working in production, I love working in production, I love the, the energy and the excitement of it, but at the same time, there's no time to, to think often. And, and um, I think having some of these resources around you, at the very least, reminds you, if you have a copy of Wittgenstein that you keep on the side of the loo, it reminds you that, um, and actually Wittgenstein is very good because despite the fact that um, it's extraordinarily complex, sometimes, uh, and particularly this book, Remarks on Color, is a useful one because he writes it, he always writes in, he writes as if he's coding, he writes in single, um, in single lines, single sentences, one point, two point, three point, and so, you can just have one of them think about it while you're on the loo and then go and do whatever else that you're doing. Um, and it's not, uh, and I'm not saying it's a platitudinous thing, but it, he's going to kind of um, play with your perception of language. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't know, whenever I, I've taught software in the past, I was used to teach, um, I don't know, things like rotoscoping. I used to teach it in, in terms of Kafka's castle and stuff like that, thinking about kind of um, things that you're reaching for that you can never quite get to. Um, 
I think that at the moment, something that would be really useful for a lot of visual effects artists to read that they might find interesting is Thomas Kuhn's um, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Is that the right? I think that's what it's called, um, which was a kind of, I don't know the date of it off, off the top of my head, but it's a late 70s book, I think. He was a, he was a f uh, philosopher of science and um, he talks about the way in which science has to be based on, and science and very much the kind of pragmatics of what we're talking about here, um, always puts itself forward as being the known given thing. Um, so SRGB right now is, is a standard, whereas I can imagine in 20 years time, there'll be another standard that comes in and completely refutes the previous standard. And that has been historically the case with, um, with science. So um, Kuhn in um, the structure of scientific revolutions will talk about um, uh, things like the X-ray, which wasn't scientifically possible, um, or it kind of, in order to, to have an X-ray, it kind of defied the, the limits of um, kind of scientific uh, knowledge at that time, and it basically meant that um, um, uh, what does it mean? It, it meant that there had to be a break with language, and and certain people had to get hot-headed and say, well, I'm going to have to stand back and um, kind of get rid of my old idea to let you come in with your new idea. But there was a, you know, it details the moment where the x-ray was there, but, uh, you know, large bodies of scientists were kind of uh, refuting the possibility of, a, of, a, of a, an x-ray. So I think right now it's a book that I've come back to since COVID, I think, to kind of, um, to go back into and think about, I don't know, the way in which science, the science kind of operates and you know, on a very basic level, I think that I think that's quite a good one to go to. Um, but I, I, in general terms, Andrew, I, I'm quite serious saying that I think that um, bringing in a, a sort of an idea of metaphysics into what uh, we're doing in production is really, really important at all stages. And it doesn't have to be just for visual effects people. It can be for um, people working in, um, I don't know, on set. Um, it can be people working uh, in pre-production at every stage I think it's really relevant and you see I get a sense of it a lot in writing uh, in, in in script writing perhaps I, I certainly think that things like um, I don't know that the, the changes in Disney let's say as a, as a really big example something like Moana and um, Dory that I said uh, but also onwards um, are, are films where you can really sense that there's something shifting there in terms of the way in which the structure of language is being used, and particularly the way in which um, I can, uh, different kind of identities are being presented. Um, but I think that that some of, I don't know, if that could be used in production a bit more again, I think that it could be a bit more exciting and make things a bit more, um, less the same, I, I, if, I, if I can say that. Great. Anything from the audience? I can keep asking questions, but I just want to make sure everyone feels welcome to ask. Um, I think one, you know, for me, the kind of a sort of simpler and more accessible way I have of relating to your work is the whole idea of HDRI and that we're working with a set of data that we can't sure. display on the screen. And uh -huh. visual effects has been doing that for many, many years of, of, of dealing with colors and brightness in a, in a numeric form that they, they can't then display on the screen. And I know yeah. that there's there's some work being done for HDRI displays, but it felt like there was a lot of excitement about that a couple of years ago. And I really haven't seen that much come to fruition, but it seems like, you know, really changing that sort of visual experience uh, yeah. if you could have black or blacks and brighter brights would be a huge step yeah. in that direction. I, I, I'm by no means an expert on this, but I was reading about, about the production of the Mandalorian and, and the way in which the, the, the so-called volume, which is this kind of technology that they've produced to, um, to rather than using HDRIs, but to make these great big video walls. Uh, hopefully there's somebody here who knows more about it than I do, but um, where they're using um, screens instead of HDRIs to, to, to light the characters and to light the set um, so that there is no kind of onset lighting. And in particular, because the, the and that was devised because the character of the Mandalorian wears this kind of uh, very shiny suit. And so, you know, the majority of the image is reflections, but um, maybe there's somebody who can talk more about that. I don't know. Um, um, yeah, my experience doesn't go much beyond the documentary they included on Disney Plus, <laughs> which I imagine most of the people here have watched anyway. Yeah. Um, but it is it is the kind of hot thing everybody's talking about in visual effects right now is the virtual production with LED screens. It's sort of everybody's asking about it. Everybody's curious mm. about it. And um, 
Yeah, and it seems like, I mean, what little I know about it is that it's part of why it worked so well for The Mandalorian is exactly as you said, the reflective helmet, but also the style of filmmaking, which um, did not involve, for example, a lot of fast moving camera shots. Um, yeah. Also, it involved a lot of more backlit scenes, for example, when you're looking yeah. into a sunset, because if things are very front lit, they risk washing out the screen behind it, you know, kind yeah. of uh, um, the, the, the brightness of the, the, the screen on one side can wash out the screen on the other side. So mm -hmm. I think it, it just particularly lent itself well to that kind of production. So it's, I think it's not the panacea that a lot of people would like it to be, but yeah. it's certainly generating a lot of excitement and is an exciting new technique. I mean, I, I just really like the name, the volume, just because it reminds me of uh, Tarkovsky or something. It makes me feel, feel like um, in, in, in his film Stalker with the zone, this kind of imaginary space that you have to walk into. Um, that's, that's what I, I, I hope <laughs> one day when I walk into the volume. Yeah, I just want to welcome C. Hannibal. Go ahead and mute yourself, jump in, ask a question. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Well, I, I wanted to say thank you first for your uh, interesting insight. It was really, really exciting. Um, so, it's not finished yet. Um, sorry? It's not finished yet. I can keep going if you want. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, so um, I, it's kind of like I was really, really intrigued by kind of like what maybe I think of as more like a technical imagination um kind of like this kind, kind of like how form and content uh, connect and how the technical um uh, trap or kind of obstacles kind of stimulate that creative imagination and and the technical imagination to like what what comes from that and and also kind of made me think about your very kind of like um um, analytic philosophical approach um, to representation and language and images, as you say, I am very familiar with Wittgenstein and his um, his philosophy and his understanding of language and what it means to our relation to the world. Um, and it, it's really interesting in terms of I'm thinking about your own work and kind of like this idea of the indirect message or kind of like, how can you show the images that you can't show? Like, how do you do that? Maybe indirectly. So I wanted, maybe wanted to hear a bit about your own creative kind of like thinking, like in that sense, like I, you kind of t t touched a bit on the technical imagination, but I'm, I'm also curious to kind of see how you think of that creativity within the, within the kind of like very technical imagination, because it's, I, maybe it's a kind of obsolete criticism, but sometimes I hear that, you know, the, the technical, the CGI, the VFX, it's very, um, artificial and not necessarily creative and maybe a bit like you know not tactile and stuff but it doesn't seem to me from your work that it has to be that way the no. opposite actually that is that this technical imagination is actually really really um kind of like really out there and really trying to push some boundaries <laughs> thank you um thank you that's a great um a great question um i think that well, I'm lucky because I still, um, I, I, I live with people who are, my partner and my daughter, my daughter less so, are extremely non-technical. My daughter suddenly started, she's seven and she started to uh, use Scratch. And suddenly I got very excited when I saw her using Scratch. Um, but so I, I live a very non-technical lifestyle when I'm at home. And then when I come to the studio, I, I'm lucky that I still get this kind of shiver every time I turn on the computer because I see um, an image uh, or, or this space and, I, and it still has a way of kind of exciting me. Or, or um, um, And it's not just because I'm seeing a kind of glowing screen, but also the thinking about the kind of the, um, the possibility that there is within it. Um, I, I certainly think that it's very easy to get logged down or uh, clogged up with technique. And I think that, I mean, technique's fantastic. Uh, don't get me wrong. I think it's very, very important with all this software to kind of go in and, and, and work through it um, in the correct way. But I think it's also, I remember when I used to talk uh, to work at um, South Bank University teaching photography there, uh, one of the first things that, the first thing that we used to do with the students on the first day uh, of the course was to give them all a Nikon camera, a half decent SLR, and to get them to take take a bad picture with it. 
and to sort of get into the mindset of like thinking beyond the default that's that's given to you sort of trying to use that tool in a way that might um i don't know it, it's not designed to be used and while i'm not here sort of trying to subvert audiences and trying to get people to kind of constantly think outside of some or think around how we might use a, a piece of equipment i i think that keeping that possibility open um, and knowing that we can sort of jump from one thing to the next to make comparisons is quite, that's what keeps me going. So Photoshop mm -hmm. on its own is really boring, but if you put it in relationship to, to Color Think Pro and then throw that information into Houdini, then that allows me to be able to kind of start writing stories in my mind, as it were. Cool, thanks. Is, is, that, is that, I don't know if that answers what you were asking. Uh, no, it was good, thank you. Okay. Um, if, if there is still a sort of a, um, an, uh, I don't know, any kind of uh, interest, I'm going to, I will talk a little bit more um, about a, another project that I've worked on, which is, uh, and this is a bit more of a, you can relax slightly more with this one or in the way that I'm going to present it, because I've been working on a project called Quasi Monte Carlo for, um, for four years, four years, maybe more, um, which I still haven't quite got to the place where I'm able to sort of describe it in such concrete terms as LAB. So it, it might be perhaps more of a sort of an entertainment and watching me talking absolute nonsense rather than kind of um, <laughs> anything more analytical, let's say. Um, but I, I will just kind of lightly or perhaps sort of deeply talk about it. Um, so let me just go back into my PowerPoint thing. How do I play this? Um, so Quasi Monte Carlo here. Um, so where, where, so where LAB asks questions about color, Quasi Monte Carlo asks questions about random number, random number generation and its relationship with image production. Um, Quasi Monte Carlo is more of a full, full blown epic pantomime than LAB, which is in part CGI. Sorry. I'm, uh, Quasi Monte Carlo is in part CGI and part filmed uh, in studio in London and also partly filmed uh, in and around the Monte Carlo Casino. Um, where LAB is a lump of coal, Quasi Monte Carlo is more porous and open to interpretation. At its core, Quasi Monte Carlo is a comedy about the snooze function on the alarm on a mobile phone and the mixture of deep dreaming and the anxiety pattern of tasks that need to be done, plate spinning, multitasking, the pull of being asleep and dreaming, being infected by the other pull, which is to wake up and get on with the day. The infected dream of being absorbed into work and being on the threshold of ending a project in order to go on holiday, brute force versus vacation. Uh, so the format of, uh, uh, of, of Quasi Monte Carlo is very important to explain because um, blah, 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 blah. in the current, there, there previously was a, a film, um, which was a feature length film, uh, which has been shown in art galleries, in, in art galleries, in, in, mainly shown in Spike Island in Bristol um, in the UK as part of a, a project that was um, supported by the Arts Council England uh, and which was also underwritten by uh, Film London, who gave a sort of a seeding grant to this project. So this is um, uh, there's a sort of grant that comes up every few years, which is for artists who want to work on a sort of smaller, uh, sort of a medium-sized budget. And I was given um, an initial seed fund of thirty thousand pounds to produce a film, um, which I haven't quite finished yet. And um, and from there, I I worked with other agencies and other people to um, uh, to, to kind of to build up this project and. Um, now it's kind of reached a place where I, I wasn't really comfortable with it being a full long single film because it didn't quite work with the idea of randomization. Um, and so I want it to exist as a series of chapters, uh, which are going to be seven, which are seven to nine minutes each, uh, which is defined by this kind of snooze time on an iPhone, the seven or nine minutes by which you kind of drip into this uh, deep sleep and then you wake up suddenly and then go deeper into a sleep and, and wake up suddenly. So there's a kind of a consciousness and going into something and then coming back out of it again. Um, and within these self-contained chapters, uh, there are consistent themes, characters and objects, but they take on different meaning in each iteration. Um, the meaning is fluid, the chapters can be viewed in a random order, and this means that it can 
that this means it's very much up to you, the viewer, to sort of start piecing together how uh, image narrative and sort of context work together. Um, so just to kind of, it's a very big project and I, I'm not so good at talking about it directly because it's an indirect pro project. Um, the way in which I've been looking at quasi-random um, algorithms uh, and the history of um, various, uh, but most importantly, the, the Monte Carlo algorithm, um, but, but the various subsets of low discrepancy sequences and, and number sequences that, that can branch off from that. Um, all of these things have come into effect, the way in which the script was made, uh, the methodology that I've used for rendering, I've kind of pulled apart several render engines, built my own render engines in order to sort of produce ways of controlling images uh, and producing images that have a very refined set of image qualities to them. Uh, the music itself, I worked with um, uh, Kenichi Iwasa, who's a, a brilliant improvisational musician. And um, he, um, Maybe I've got a picture of, I, I have a picture of Kenichi later on, I'll show you. Um, and he um, he produced a series of recordings when he did a residency in CERN in Geneva. And I, I believe he told me that it was inside the Hadron Collider. And we used a lot of these samples to produce the soundtrack in a sort of quasi random way. Um, that's not quite finished either. Uh, and then the final thing is the editing system, which is that I am currently working on a Python script, which allows me to um, to incorporate Helton sequences into which the way Helton sequences are quasi-random um, methods of making random selections. Um, using Python to use those to um, produce, uh, first of all, to basically edit the film for me, uh, as in to, to choose which um, core um, scenes go together, but also on a sort of frame by frame basis, I'm using Python to um, to shuffle both the images uh, and also the AOVs of each image. So we kind of get into this, um, not just randomization of image and sound, but a randomization of what, what the hell is it that I'm looking at. Um, I'm only, I can't show you that, I can describe it, but but you have to take my word for it at the moment. Um, I, I was going to talk about um, low discrepancy sequences, but I, f I feel like it might be better to, to just kind of zoom on with this. And then if there's time at the end, I'll go back to it. Um, so, so very quickly, this whole thing that I'm talking about um, uh, is kind of held together by um, a hypnotist um, and I was interested, so I was, what I haven't said is why was I interested in randomization? I was interested in randomization, um, uh, I've got a written thing here. I was interested in it because I was interested in um, algorithms that are used to create global illumination within uh, rendered images in, for photorealistic image making. Um, and I was sort of curious as to what, what were the things that make some processes more expensive than others. and and. And also because there were so many references to Monte Carlo and Russian roulette that it kind of, it struck me as being somehow related to an idea of a dream or a dream, the dream that we might associate with a casino, let's say, that I might go there and win something big. Uh, also this kind of, you know, there's something quite exciting about the, the, the random in the casino, I guess. I've never used a casino, but I, I like the idea of it. Um, and it also somehow has this cinematic thing as well, of course, uh, the idea of Monte Carlo. Um, but I, but I, I started by looking at global illumination patterns and methods, and I, I, I ripped apart various um, ray tracing software and various um, uh, render engines. Um, I particularly looked very deeply into the, um, the, the way that V-Ray uses a deterministic Monte Carlo sampling method, which basically means that it, it places um, points or sample points within a, a 3D space uh, where the the camera then casts out rays into those spaces. And, um, and that produces a sort of an intelligent report that the camera can use to then choose where to position its secondary or indirect or global illumination rays. Um, and the sort of the, the distribution or the scattering of those um, points within a, a 3D scene um, are, are defined by different quasi-random um, methods. So if there were, were no uh, randomization and I was to render a scene, um, the scene, if, if everything was uniform and the light was scattered in a totally uniform way, it would look completely unrealistic, flat. It would kind of look like um, Toy Story 
did in the, whatever it was, 1995 or something. Um, although I think that had GI as well. I'm, I don't know, but it, it would look very much like kind of pure um, uh, direct lighting without any kind of indirect lighting. Um, or it could produce some kind of strange striated effects, which it does do sometimes if you play with it. Um, however, these various different render engines use different methods to sample onto a space to throw out dots into an imaginary space where the camera is then going to shoot out its light, which then eventually ends up at the sun. Um, so CGI, as we know, kind of works back to front. Um, and so really that was it. I mean, this thing about diffusion, the idea that we could create a palpably real image by, by creating the most randomly diffuse thing. Um, and that took me to looking at Monte Carlo and it took me to realizing that, um, that there is this link with the casino where um, I, I don't have, I, I haven't written down a script unfortunately today, but um, uh, where various mathematicians, not just the ones which are kind of, um, uh, which we give to the to Monte Carlo method, there are several others in that history which uh, used the casino in, in the 18, um, in 1890, um, in order to, um, to, to, to use the, the roulette tables as a way of taking caches of random samples in order to test out different um, quasi Monte Carlo or Monte Carlo methods, which can be used to predict the future, as it were. But, you know, these are um, simulation methodologies that can be used to predict what's going to happen next um, and to produce, I don't know, AI and Siri and whatnot that we use nowadays. Um, and what interested me very much was the various anecdotes that are associated with this, yeah, including uh, the idea that um, an early uh, version of the Monte Carlo um, equation uh, w was, was supposed to work, but then um, based on the reports of the roulette tables that were in the, um, in the, the Monaco newspaper, um, it, the, the system that was being used just simply wasn't working um, and, and the Monte Carlo simulator wasn't working. But um, it, it turned out that the uh, journalists who were recording the results from the roulette tables had actually just gotten drunk in the bar and weren't actually reporting on what the numbers were. They were putting down random numbers because random numbers can just be thought up randomly. Um, but then what, what becomes interesting from that is that actually um, it's quite difficult for us as humans to, to, to think up random number sequences. So if I asked you to think of a random number sequence, you might be able to do so um, that might fit into something that was close to a sort of quasi-random number generator for maybe the length of two telephone numbers. But beyond that, our memory kind of drops out and we start to repeat ourselves or we fall into sort of patterns. Um, and to underline this, the thing that I didn't say was that, you know, mathematically, randomization is another one of these things which is completely impossible. There is no mathematical randomization. Um, all there is is interpretations of randomization, much like sRGB is an interpretation of color. Um, the, the, uh, the Sobol sequence that we use so much in Houdini is, uh, which is uh, in, involved in the scatter node, um, is that is uh, just a, a cheap and efficient version of um, quasi-random uh, sampling, which kind of exists um, over a number of, uh, which is easy to use. Um, I've got a slide up here that doesn't relate to what I've just been saying, but I'm going to jump into it um, before I get bogged down with sampling, uh, which is that, uh, so I, I basically took this kind of model of thinking and I applied it to writing a script. And I decided that I wanted to use it to inform a kind of automatic script writing. Um, I had previously worked with a hypnotist um, and found uh, a clinical hypnotist and found that experience to be um, sort of highly provocative and uh, gave me these sort of hallucinations that were very easy to remember, very vivid, um, and pretty wild. Um, wild in the sense of like uh, what I would want a CGI film to look like or something, but but also taking you to places that are kind of so beautiful or so, so tall or whatever. Um, and uh, while I don't discredit at all hypnosis as a basis for, for kind of true um, medical uh, that it, it can be used to help. I also found very quickly that I can use it as a generative tool to produce uh, data that I use within script writing or within image making. So I, um, in the sort of true form of a of a, a solver, I kind of thought of it as a solver where we had to have sort of known inputs and then uh, expected outputs that would come out of it. And particularly when working with um, uh, 
a, a hypnotist, it's quite easy to um, control the way in which, or the, the parameters of how a hallucination might be, where if you have a dream, it can go everywhere. Whereas when you're working with a hypnotist, it's very much more like what I've heard of as lucid dreaming, where you're kind of sort of putting in limits to control things. So we did this and I set up a sort of set of parameters. And, and from this, after a couple of visits, we um, it, it produced a lot of content, which I then was able to kind of translate and, and write down and use as the basis for a series of scripts and or a series of sort of vignettes that came together with no actual links to each other, but they formed fragments of information, which I've subsequently struggled hard to kind of piece together and, and uh, make them kind of fit together. But um, I guess that the aim of the project is to give them back to you, for you to um, uh, to piece them together and somehow and, and for you to kind of uh, make something of it. Um, I want to, let's just watch a, a bit of video very quickly. Um, and uh, we're going to start with this um, little clip of Jackie talking. Um, this is a clip because it doesn't matter how hard you try, it will be impossible for you to imagine this beautiful, beautiful image by looking for it directly. And so instead, you need to cast out five, seven or nine rays of thought in different directions with unbounded force. Let them scatter. Let them hit the walls, bounding and rebounding in a truly unbiased way. And in so doing, they will describe the inside of a newly tiled bedroom or the thin channel of air between a salmon viscous shirt and a sensitive area of skin on the back of his neck. Are you ready? We begin. So Jackie Babu plays the character of Moiré, and Moiré guides you through these kind of different um, hallucinatory experiences, which are diffuse in meaning and, and in experience. She's, um, we, we, I worked with Jackie, who I've worked with several times before, but she, um, we found a way to kind of put the, the speech back onto you as an audience. And now, um, I know this seems quite far from a, a Houdini talk, so I'm just going to quickly try and contextualize it because in many ways this is this whole project is a poem dedicated to um, people that work in visual effects in many ways it's kind of you know I, I, I let me shut up I'll show you a bit more about it now 19 rouge 28 noir finish your pastis two steps back prepare to make a simulation ba 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 Dead underscore Denson underscore open bracket summer underscore final close bracket version underscore two stop dollar F four stop B G O stop S C cash. Andrew, when, when I show that, is it looking really staggered and or how is it looking? Uh, it's not too bad. I mean, there, there are some frames dropped, but it's, it's, it's definitely watchable. It's okay. Okay. So the, the, um, as I say, the film is punctuated by these different speeches. This, and each of them are kind of a poem to, let's, let's say for argument's sake in this context, it's a poem to visual effects artists. I, I don't necessarily think that's the, that the whole truth, but certainly ideas to do with visual effects and particularly to do with Houdini were, were put into this solver when I was working with the hypnotist um, by which, um, so when she's talking, she kind of is constantly caching uh, all of these ideas that you have out and we're, we're using a kind of, um, well, um, Ted Danson gets mixed up with um, sort of BGEO files all over the place within this film. Um, let me show one more clip of, uh, of, of Jackie talking to give you a sense of where she's coming from. This is a, uh, a section called Brute Force. And again, this is, um, maybe I could just read from what I've written here because um, this is kind of very much going into, uh, maybe it's, it's an ode to uh, what it's like to be uh, in a moment of production when um, 
uh, at the sort of cold face where things are really kind of where the pressure is really ramping up and i think that this part is about having your supervisor coming over and looking at what you're doing i think that's what it's about it might be about other things but from over there the big ideas guy turns up very tall your highness he starts berating the number nine don't rest there is no time i've had a vision the big ideas guy is a firework in slow motion, always at the moment of exploding. Spectacular. Volatile. Pause. Frown. Reflect. A giant imaginary equal sign, all the nine and the firework together. Equality. Slouched in mismatched plastic chairs attending an invisible barbecue. Stop. Brute force is you, nine years younger. It thinks differently to you now, more curious, more interested. Stop, stop. You put your hand on your younger shoulder and proudly introduce them to all of the different parts of you. The bridge, the collector, the field mouse the administrators. They all look a little bit tense. Maybe it's too hot to be wearing suit jackets. Okay, so uh, bef so before we go on, I do want to say that the, uh, the camera work for this shot, Brute Force, and also for the, the first one that we watched, uh, were all done by the extraordinary Tyna Gallus, who's here. So, um, Tina is the, the kind of the, the magician that's involved in this, so I, I can't um, recommend a, a director of photographer more than I would do with with Tina. So uh, please um, go and um, uh, work with her now, straight away. Um, uh, I, what I want to do quickly is to run through some of the other things that go into this film um, to sort of make it. While I've just shown you filmed content. And in fact, film content, which is um, is not quite finished because there will be a sort of a layer of particle effects and blah, 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 which which probably will go over it in the final, final, final versions of it, whatever that means. Um, I, I still think of the spoken word monologues as being somehow the most in, um, intricately Houdini-esque parts of, of, of the film that I've been working on. Um, that being said, uh, I built an awful lot of sets um, for the film and um they it's sort of the whole film exists in in lots of different spaces let me just talk through a little bit about what this is um and and sort of try and map it onto um these kind of metaphors that jackie was talking about moire was talking about um often we have these discussions about brute force we have discussions about the builders and the administrators and we talk about um uh there's one other thing the big ideas guy. This is kind of production force. And and this relates to, first of all, there's a, a TV show that takes place, which is a kind of kids TV show, which is centered around these two manta rays and also these builders that come in. And Alison, who appears later on in the film as, a, as the person who is on holiday. Um, and these builders are building houses, which are also the same houses that you may have also been on holiday in as an Airbnb flat. Um, and these, you know, you sort of wake up one morning and suddenly, the builders are rebuilding it because the house has been flooded. Um, and then it turns out that the builders have built this little house for some mice to live in. And you look around this little house and then it turns into an imaginary flat in Monaco that existed in the 1980s. So it kind of takes this arc of um, sort of dreamlike arc, as it were. Um, and once you're in this imaginary space, there's a kind of colorful neon piece of toilet roll that flies around in the air. And then Kenichi Iwasa, there he is, um, plays some beautiful synthesizer music to you um, in his sort of imaginary CGI world, um, which is this kind of club that, that, or this kind of strange Monaco apartment um, from the 1980s. Um, another form of brute force that exists within the film is this kind of um, fleet of manta rays that keep kind of figuring, the, the mantra rays, let's say, but. Um, these guys uh, are kind of performing synchronized swimming in the Bay of Monte Carlo. And it was kind of fun to, to map um, footage from the Bay and, and, and sort of uh, composite 
these guys into it to allow them to do their um, their synchronized swimming and dancing and splashing. Um, we've also got parts where these guys, the the glove puppets that I just showed you that were in a TV show, uh, the Manta Ray glove puppets, they kind of come into CGI and, and, and that all gets a bit strange. This kind of breakdown of reality becomes uh, kind of very, very densely layered. Um, let's see, I just want to show uh, something about the manta rays here, just so you know what I'm talking about. This is... You're excited yeah. about going on holiday? Me too! But have you packed everything you need? This whole thing exists in a CGI set, so the TV oh. is CGI. What did you film. say, Ray? And then the, the film set that we were just looking at is CGI, and now it's not. And um, that gets confusing on purpose. Um, so Alison, who was there on a TV show, is also here um, guiding the, the, the sort of um, the, the manta rays, who are the kind of um, the workers who are working on your behalf while you're on holiday um, anxiously. And um, they are sort of coming out of this um, mining rig, as it were. Um, they're sort of coming from a, a digital being into being, um, I don't know, somehow palpably real manta rays. And they kind of do their thing. I, I guess that this is look, looks awful on your screen, so I'm sorry if it does. Um, here's Alison again in Monte Carlo um, with Kenichi. And they're, they're kind of doing their best to, to, to guide these um, manta rays. Uh, and now we're back in the office where the administrators are working. Administrators are the baddies. They're the ones who um, who are kind of, uh, I guess, that they're kind of clamping down on your imaginative forces. Um, and the, the manta rays are saying, come on, come and join us, you know, drop all the work. Let's go on holiday. And, um, and yeah, so I guess that I set up a, uh, this fever of manta rays um, to kind of um, to, to do work in a pleasurable way, let's say. I think, oh, it, it keeps going on. It's kind of similar. I'll stop it there. So uh, that's one of the aspects of the film. And then just very quickly, I, I know this, this probably sounds like I'm an absolute madman, but what I'm trying to say is that these are kind of like nuggets of, of narrative uh, moments that um, that that have come from these hypnotic um, uh, sort of encounters, and which I've been somehow allowed to put into film, and uh, yeah, and which will be reformulated into these nine-minute chunks that you kind of experience or breathe your way into somehow. At the moment, they look like quite rational pieces of footage. That's because I haven't yet had the chance to kind of shuffle around with the AOVs and and um, uh, the the way in which the, the editing works too much. Um, that's kind of a job for the winter. Um, I guess that kind of closing this part of it off, I just wanted to also talk about the um, this lucky horse, which was one of the kind of elements of the film. It's one of the, let's say, if I'm talking about building a solver where these different parts have different ideas, uh, this lucky horse is, a, is an important part of that equation because this exists in the Hotel de Paris, which is just next to the casino in Monte Carlo. And historically, lots of quite wealthy people have gone to that hotel and they've touched the knee of that horse uh, in order to bring them good luck in the morning before they go into the casino. And um, filming this, we, we saw a lot of... Um, people doing that. Um, but I went out to film in Monaco several times and between times they changed the interior of the hotel um, in quite an extraordinary way. It was such a, uh, I preferred the old one. Um, and and they kind of pulled in this, they completely changed the floor and completely changed the, the furnishings. But the horse stays in exactly the same place and it's Louis the 14th on his horse. So I guess that I used that within the film. Uh, and so we had these guys, Seamus and Guillaume, who were the builders who were involved in building the doll's houses and uh, you know, helping you go on holiday while you're looking after your flat while you're away. Uh, but they're also uh, involved in redoing this interior in my story. And um, so we had a sort of situation where they borrowed the horse and then made a series of plaster cast copies of the horse and then 
turned that into a sort of a, a, a very large um, room full of horses. And, and the, the point being this horse had, um, you know, this magical lucky force. And I guess that within the film, um, the characters are, are sort of conspiring to find a way to combine this luck so that they can kind of, uh, I guess, um, hedge their bets and, and um, um, be more likely to win in the casino, which will then pay for the holiday that they're on. And it, it's sort of a, an anxiety dream that goes round and round and round in circles. And eventually there's a great big flood and, and, and we're kind of left on the beach with, with just uh, you know, a horse. Um, I, I feel like I'm going to spiral into complete madness if I, if, in terms of what I'm talking about. So I feel like I should stop talking about it now. But I ho hope that was enough to kind of give you a sense of the, the breadth of this project. Uh, just to explain again, this is something which exists on the scale of, uh, I don't know, there's hundreds of hours of footage, but um, it, it will come together in, a, a, in its new format. It will be approximately a, a 90 minute film. Um, and I'm very grateful that grid markets have been supporting me in the latter stages of it um, on new simulations that are useful to kind of piece these um, things together. Grid markets provided me with a um, very generous uh, grant during COVID uh, to, to use their render farms for simulations and have, have um, pledged some more money for the next sort of um, batch of working on it. So go and use grid markets. All right. Well, um, this has been really um, eye-opening and mind-expanding for a uh, Houdini users group. I, I wonder, you know, like the ones I've been to before, uh, um, very different from this. So I just, it's fascinating and you've really got me thinking. Um, any, uh, any last minute questions or, uh, oh, we do have a question here. Um, where, how would we end up watching the result once it's at that stage? Absolutely. Um, I, what, what I wanted to do, but I was sort of um, ran out of time, was to put a thing on my website, which is www.paulsimonrichards.com. And I wanted to put a mailing list thing, which I will do in the next few days. Um, I won't spam you with lots of stuff, but it will be a way that I can share with you. Um, I would like to share full versions of these films, um, but at the moment I'm, sort of, for various reasons, unable to put it out completely um, on online. So, um, the best thing to do if you want to stick your name on that list and be somebody who will see some of that stuff is to just send me an email at info.paulsimonrichards.com. But I know that that's a bit intrusive. So I will set up a thing so people can join the mailing list. Um, that, that's the best thing I can suggest. And, and there'll be, I, 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 these things are shown in online and in physical spaces, but perhaps the most reliable way to see something in the next few months will be to do that well that's great well this has been an absolute pleasure and, and genuinely interesting and unusual um so uh, i just want to thank you very much and uh, you know thanks side effects and houdini for you know helping get this organized and um yeah any closing statements paul anything you want to finish with um no uh... can i briefly just uh chime in to uh to say thanks um Really appreciated it. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, Paul, I mentioned to you on Instagram that this is something that we haven't seen in the Houdini user group before, and I was actually really looking forward to it. And uh, oh, great. you're def definitely delivered. So um, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I think it's it's great in general when, um, you know, as a, a like a VFX artist, a 3D artist, animator, um, any one of those, you, you just sit and um, tune out sort of the rest of reality for so much of the day that I think things like this, where you really think about, you know, what are you doing as, as a human being when you're sitting behind a computer and pressing these buttons, you know, it's just, it's just great to have in your mind, you know, just as a life thing. Um, so, you know, anyway, uh, so, just wanted sorry, to say what, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you. When you say it's great to have in your mind, you mean the experience that, that there's a horse in the sea that it's all imaginary or that, that which, which part of it? Well, the more about your sort of philosophical, um, philosophical approach to, to work um, and, and specifically that of the 3d artists, because mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, again, like, you know, as a, whatever you do, you know, but someone who sits behind the computer all day, 
um, pressing buttons, that kind of, you, you can lose sight of, um, you know, what you're doing as a person. I feel like it's really easy just because you can get in a flow state all day and, and then, you, you know, tune out the rest of the day. But um, to think of these sort of as larger concepts and, you know, art as just a, you know, we're working in art, but it's, it's, it's evolved over the course of history and just all like all of these connections that you're bringing up, I think are, it's just great to, to every now and again, go back to, you know, like the book you mentioned, I also um, put one in the chat, uh, which I love referring to every now and again, which is uh, by Brasson, uh, Notes on the Cinematograph. Mm -hmm. um, just, uh, it's more of a stream of consciousness sort of bullet points. Um, uh, but it, yeah, great sort of nuggets of, um, of info every now and again to pick up. So, but yeah, in general, thank you. And I, I, I said earlier that I, I really do recommend spending a bit of time at this website, the Center for Visual Music. Um, just, I don't know, I, um, this I, it feels like to me, it's, it's a bit kind of macho and sweaty somehow. It sort of, it, it sort of, I don't know, that there is a style to that whole thing, but there was definitely something exciting going on there, which I find refreshing whenever I go back there. And, and it would be kind of, um, I don't know, useful for you all right well once again thank you so much paul thanks everybody for attending and uh yeah we'll see you next time excellent okay thanks all bye okay. bye bye